would like to talk to you about the positive things uh, that are happening on the continent. More than 20, 20 African countries have renewable energy as their main source of energy. We have countries on, this conti on our continent that, I mean, that where the share of renewables is, is about 90%. Uh, all, I mean, for the whole continent, I'm talking about 55 countries, the share of renewables in our energy mix is 40.5%, the highest in the world. So if anyone is to talk about renewable energy and what's happening in energy of Africa, uh, in the world, Africa is the pioneer. We are the stewards for the whole globe in terms of uh, renewable energy, and this should be reported. And I don't know of any country on this continent, whether it's a producer or importer of, of fossil fuel that does not have a strong uh, renewable energy program. What happened over the last few years is that uh, the cost of renewable energy generation has uh, become more affordable, and that's a good thing. However, the African common position that we went uh, with to the COP27 and again on the 28th states that we're going to use everything that we have in hand in order to ensure that Africa, all Africans, uh, women, girl, man, old, uh, 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 young, every small or big business is connected to electricity and that we forever bridge as well uh, the uh, 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 unhealthy cooking uh, 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 gap and to ensure that you know all Africans, as I said, have also access to clean cooking. So what are we doing at the African Union? One, we're having the African um, uh, market for electricity because uh, Africa is, has an ab abundance of you know, sources of energy. We want to make sure that the continent is connected, and that is, what is being generated is being shared. We produce, we generate, we share, and we transmit energy. So we not only talk about generation, but also transmission, which is often absent from discussions. We are working on our transport system, which consumes about 25% of fossil fuel to ensure that we uh, prioritize things like railways, uh, 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 urban transportation, you know, uh, 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 mass transportation, so as to, uh, someone earlier, I mean, the Prime Minister was talking about cars, so as to alleviate our, you know, our streets from, the, from cars or unhealthy, uh, uh, informal uh, tra means of transportation. We are working, and th this has not been mentioned today, on energy efficiency. How to optimize the use of what we already have in order to avail more energy to people. And just to let you know that in our continent, we are losing between 30 to 40% of energy because of poor transmission. Uh -huh. So we, all of this requires what? Requires, you know, expertise, it requires finance, I'm not going to open about finance. You heard enough about it today, and I adhere and second and third everything that was said this morning by our leaders. We're having programs dedicated by region and by country uh, to be implemented by the, uh, uh, our uh, development agency, uh, the Auda Nepad, uh, that uh, is working on energy generation, energy transmission, but also water, digitalization, uh, uh, and transport. And why I'm, I stress digitalization? Because again, Africa is the leader when it comes to the use of digitalization mm -hmm. and digital tools and the nexus with energy is providing us with new ways, you know, of working on and providing energy like, you know, when you have many grids and you pay uh, as you go with your with mobile and so many other tools when it comes to efficiencies in terms of using energy and or collecting data on energy and so on and so forth. So we're using every technology that is available every technology that becomes affordable. So it's not enough to say use a renewable, use a renewable. You want to make sure that it's affordable to us as well. Uh, we, we, some of our countries started even the retrofitting, which is a huge task, which is a huge task. And then I, I, I brought into the discussion the issue of transport. Last but not least, I want to um, uh, maybe uh, uh, stress issues of um, of women 
And it is important, and when I, when I spoke about energy and uh, un, uh, unhealthy cooking, is that I, I, I heard what was said in the previous panels. I would like us all to think of what was said about, you know, these small businesses for women. Uh, let us, since I'm sitting here also, there's lots of business people. And, and for good, anything that says um, microcredit for women. We want women to access the big bucks mm. and to be... And we have established the African Women, the African Network for Women in Infrastructure. We want them to be heads, you know, of these big, huge, multi-million, even billion firms that are working on railways, on electricity, on transmission, on digital, to own them and to lead them. And at the African Union, even in the procurement system, we have put a quota, 10% of the, uh, of the projects have to go to women heads of, of these firms or leading those firms or owners of these firms. So I'm not here to talk about small businesses, I'm talking about the big parts, the big business, the, the business of millions, and we want to see women up there making the rules for everybody else, and I thank you. Thank you. William, if I can turn the floor to you. Um, so what more does Africa require from the international community in philanthropy for an equitable energy future? And how can we collectively step up to make sure Africa stays on track? Um, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, important question. And thank you to SE for All and uh, Unstoppable Africa, Gabby, for having us here. Now, first of all, look, Africa needs a lot of things, all right? And as we talk about a just energy transition, we have heard passionate speakers speak about global financial architecture reform, the need for investment, debt restructuring, uh, as well as lowering the cost of capital. All these things we need. We need that for a just energy transition. But all these things, many of these things we don't control. All right? The decisions about how fast and how ambitious those changes will be are in the hands of others. So I think we should push for those. I think Prime Minister Mia Motley was very passionate. We should continue to push for those in the global south and Africa in particular, a global financial architecture reform, debt relief, SDR reallocation, you know, lowering the cost of capital. Those things are all important, access to markets, but we don't control them. How about we also, as we push for these things, talk about what we do control. And what we do control, I think the Commission has just spoken about our potential for renewable energy. That's 100% within our control. We can create new financial instruments using that potential. And I'll tell you how. So renewable energy has got one problem, whether it's solar or wind. It has the challenge of intermittency. You cannot use it 24 hours. When there's no wind, there's no electricity. When there's no sun, there is no electricity. We've got to solve that challenge. Today, there is technology around battery energy storage systems that can be en enhanced, and especially in Africa where we have so much potential for solar and wind, if we get together, perhaps under the African Union Commission, and go to these manufacturers with and aggregate our demand, the cost of these will come down, all right? And then we can begin to solve the challenge of intermittency. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, let me give you an example. We have to be ambitious about our energy. We have to be extremely ambitious about our renewable energy. I'll give you an example. Kenya today has over 90% renewable energy. His Excellency, the President talked about it which is fantastic. But our peak demand mm. for energy today in Kenya is three gigawatts. Our population is 51, 52 million. South Africa has a population of 55 million, you know, maybe two or three million more. Their peak demand is 55 gigawatts. What is the difference between Kenya and South Africa? 
It doesn't mean that South African individuals as citizens are consuming that much more. An individual can only consume so much more. The difference is industry. The difference is that South Africa's 55 gigawatts of demand is driven by industry. Now, when we model for our energy demand, we model on the basis of our current demand. What about if we started modeling and say, look, why shouldn't Kenya have a, a demand peak of 55 megawatts? What would it take to get to that? And then use that to attract industry that is finding it very expensive to manufacture in the global north because of taxes and because of the, uh, the, 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 the demand for them to reduce their carbon footprint to come and manufacture, and then we can export our renewable energy. That's a brand new financial instrument. Nobody's talking about that. And it's 100% within our control. We must push for global financial architecture reform. We must do that. That is very important. But it, we cannot expect people who are not us, we don't control those things, to change those things at the speed and ambition that we want. So let's focus on what we control. We control our regulations. We control how ambitious we can be. Uh, and we control how we treat our investors yeah. and make sure that they feel comfortable in the countries that we, we cover and they, where they invest in. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you. That's a good lead into the next question, actually, as you created like what's needed and wanted in the future. So Mary Lect of Freetown, please share your perspectives on the role of governments and what they have to play to create an enabling environment to build a clean energy future. Thank you very much. And given that I'm a mayor, or Mary Lect, I've been sworn in at the moment, but I have <laughs> been the mayor for the past five years, um, I'd like to take this from a different angle. An angle you don't normally hear in settings like this, and that is from the local authority, the sub-national government. And I'd like to start off by saying, as Commissioner said, when you have a situation where 600 million people do not have access to power, almost a billion don't have access to clean cooking, um, then we need all hands on deck. And I want to make a case for the fact that at this point in time, our response to this crisis, the climate crisis, the fact that we're seven years away from the SDGs and we're not anywhere as close as we should be means that we need to bring city governments into the mix and not expect everything to flow through the nation states. So that said, I thought perhaps I'd give some um, examples of some of the innovative work that we're doing at the city just to give a flavor for how if we have this being replicated and the space is given, and the finance is given, how much more we can achieve, and how much faster we can go in this race. So Freetown, 82% of our cooking fuel in our city is wood or charcoal based. And that's, that's the statistics I'm sure you'll hear over and over again. We're doing two things in respect to that, because with, the, with energy, um, Commissioner talked about the pollution. We have an air pollution issue. We are planting a million trees. Hashtag Freetown the Tree Town. We started in 2020, and by the end of next month, we will have a million trees in the ground growing. And that is almost one tree per 1.5 people in the city, which is incredible for improving air. It's incredible for um, protecting water. And when it comes to the, the question of the clean cooking, cooking, it's not fixing that problem, but it's mitigating against it. Moving on to the use of biomass. Again, there's a lot of work that can be done off grid. We only have about 60% of our population in the city on grid. And unfortunately, most of that grid in the rainy season is hydro, but in the dry season it's predominantly from a chip that is, is polluting and providing traditional diesel fuel. So what we've done is experimented with one market. We're using a biodigester. We're converting the organic waste from that market. And in July, no, it was in June, I was super thrilled to turn on the light for a community of 7,000 people off of that biodigester. And we're now putting in, 
we're now putting in plans, and that's not going into their homes, that's just lighting the community. So it means we have street lights, it means we have water, communal water that's being pumped from that energy. But if we can scale that, and we're applying to do that, that's a model that we can really replicate, not just in Freetown, but elsewhere. We're working now on a project to take our biomass at, at city level from the city dump site been working on this for a number of years, um, going down the World Bank route, but now we're bringing a private sector firm in, and the aim is waste to energy, which will then have the issues of transmission, of coming into the grid, but if we can replicate the biodigesters, community by community, that's transformative. And I'll give one final example on energy. Freetown does not have mass transit. The 80% of our population move in low occupancy, heavy polluting, heavy energy using uh, Okadas, the motorbikes, or, or Kekes, the three wheelers. We are two years, we have a two year, one year into a two year full feasibility study to introduce a cable car. That cable car will cut travel time from two and a half, two and a half hours east to west of the city to 20 minutes, and it will move 6,000 people an hour, and it will be powered by solar. So this is being done with funding from C40 cities, the feasibility study, but this is the, for me, this is the trick. It took us three years to be able to get funding for a feasibility study. And if you think that cities can be the engine of growth, we can work with nation states and do more, then we need access to finance, we need our mandates to be opened up, and we need nation states to know that we're not competitors, we're collaborators. Thank you. That is so inspiring. Um, Taria, what is the role of carbon markets in financing Africa's economic transformation and climate action energy transition being central? Um, thank you. Um, uh, carbon credits and carbon credit markets, I mean, there are a few different uh, ones from compliance to voluntary carbon markets and the like, but they are all a powerful tool um, to drive a dual mandate, and that dual mandate being the reduction of emissions and climate action, as well as the channeling of capital to where it's needed most. And Africa is a compelling value proposition for the carbon um, for the carbon markets for a couple reasons. One of which is that there are lots of concerns about the quality of supply, and one of the big um, ways to drive quality of supply is the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that can be driven alongside um, this, the, the production and supply of carbon credits. And so therefore, the African carbon credit has the potential to be some of the highest quality uh, credit that you can find. Um, also, um, Africa presents um, some of the largest carbon sinks, so in terms of the quality of, of um, the, the type of projects that come out of Africa. And of course, there's renewable energy. And the fact that um, not only in energy transition in respect of shifting off diesel as an example and replacing that renewable energy, uh, clean cooking presents a significant opportunity for carbon credits. In fact, some of the best quality carbon credit projects are in the clean cooking space. And we're seeing great ways for benefit sharing across local communities with clean cooking projects, as well as the benefit sharing to women. And so um, we really are, um, see Africa as a great supplier of carbon credits and great supplier of high quality, uh, co-benefit oriented carbon credits. Um, but the challenge we have with the markets is that, yes, they're coming across some challenges right now. Um, the total voluntary carbon market size is about $2 billion. Africa, I think uh, Paul's going to talk about the scale of Africa's contribution to that and the need to increase that. Um, I run one of, I'm the co-chair of the steering committee of one of the standards guidance frameworks called the Voluntary Carbon Markets Integrity Initiative, VCMI. We are uh, focused more on the buy side in terms of integrity. But what we're basically seeing is that the way for the carbon markets to channel more capital to Africa and indeed to the developing economies is if these markets are built on integrity. And I think there's, you've probably heard a lot of the criticism about carbon markets. Um, those criticisms have a place for some of the outliers and some of the problematic projects and problematic buyers. But carbon credit markets are ultimately going to be transformational for how we can get more capital to energy transition projects, to reforestation projects, economic development. But integrity is central. 
Um, and so there's a couple organizations that have done some great work this year, ours being one of them, helping to stop greenwashing. One of the big criticisms of carbon markets is the risk of corporate greenwashing. Our organization is giving organizations the guidance framework through our, um, our design to protect against that. Um, we also have standards for supply um, to ensure that their core carbon principles under um, the Integrity Council for how so supply is driven. So um, it's, um, it's, an, it's a very important time but for us, it's a call to action. We think it's very critical, the formation of the African uh, Carbon Markets Integrity, um, uh, Carbon Markets <laughs> Initiative is fundamental to us really being able to drive action in these markets. We want to see more buyers participating. We want to see the empowerment of developers. And also, we need countries to get involved. VCMI has done some work with developing access strategies for how governments can engage with VCMs and compliance market. We would like to see all parties getting involved to stand these markets up because they do present a powerful tool, a powerful financial tool in the solution space. Paul, I can't see. Paul, if you could pick up the conversation here on what do you see as the strategies that you believe needs to be implemented to promote and enhance transparency, accountability, and availability of reliable data in the African carbon markets? No, I think it's, it's a critical question. When you just listen to Katria, the simple reality that you are in a space that has such low emissions, um, such potential for high... Uh, l l low emissions energy and industry production, uh, a huge uh, employable population, and huge carbon sinks, but it's still not really leveraging the opportunity, that's a market failure. And that's really what called for the uh, creation of the Afro Africa Carbon Markets Initiative to really bring together all the stakeholders and actors across the ecosystem to critically unpack what needs to be done differently to really uh, unlock the value that, that can come from the carbon market generation space. Uh, and integrity, integrity, integrity is where it starts. Uh, we're very glad to have really the key partners working with on both the, the demand and the supply side that are really looking at making sure we're applying the highest quality standards on what is being generated and then the terms and conditions in which uh, those are being offtaken. I think one kind of stone that's consistently thrown is just you know accusations that Africa is just allowing bad behaviors to simply continue because you're, you're selling off credits. But when you look at the integrity principles, those start with first and foremost, you must have abatement and emissions reduction as a condition to any offtake. So it's not just uh, allowing for bad behavior to continue, it's really catalyzing a shift in uh, conduct and behavior that can really un un unlock uh, potential. When you look at even the, the observations around the, the value that can come from clean cooking in terms of improve, improved livelihoods, we have to start with an acknowledgement that the greatest risk for deforestation on this continent is cooking. Feeding people is the thing that's causing all these trees to be cut. So unless we're having a fundamental shift in the way we approach uh, cooking and really leveraging technology and frankly, even the, the technology that comes with tracking the data around those solutions starts building transparency. The things that people are saying, well, we're not sure how it's performing. When you look at the, some of those clean clothing solutions, they're chipped. So you know exactly how long it's been on, what it's generated, what it has offset, and therefore what is tradable. And it's that critical clarity on the fundamentals that we hope will really shift um, really the conversation and really start helping us really address some of the de-risking realities we need on the continent. There tends to be a presumption that Africa is just not equivalent to other. And it's only through information access, clarity, and really maintaining the highest standards on how that information is availed and reported on a consistent basis that you start saying it is completely comparable and frankly, hugely competitive because of the low, low emission levels that are in place. Well, unfortunately, we're at time. 
Um, I want to thank the panel for being so inspiring, patient as well, right? <laughs> I want to acknowledge that. Thank you so much and for giving us lots to think about.